Um, as you heard, my name is Robin Mellon. I'm the Chief Executive Officer of the Supply Chain Sustainability School, and I'll be both MC today and talking you through just a little bit about the school as we go. So, by way of an introduction, uh, I just want to tell you uh, about the work of the school. Some of you will know this already, and so I can give you a little bit of an, of an update uh, just over the next five to ten minutes. If we cast our minds back to the, the Sydney Olympics, uh, now 17 years ago, good grief, uh, 17 years ago, that was really the genesis uh, of the Green Builder Council of Australia. That was the first time, uh, or one of the first times, that Australia's property industry had come together to try and define best practice. And in the same way, if we look at the London Olympics in 2012, already five years ago, um, that was uh, the genesis of the Supply Chain Sustainability School because they had, uh, as all Olympics over the last you know, 20 years or so, they had staked their claim that this would be the greenest games ever. And so the Commission for a Sustainable London was set up to try and document that. What does that look like? What do the greenest games ever look like in terms of tons of concrete or the kilos of food waste or in particular the knowledge in the supply chains? And so this was the genesis of the Supply Chain Sustainability School. Uh, the Net Balance Foundation uh, licensed the school uh, from the UK, uh, and so we worked very closely with them. Uh, and then uh, EY uh, came and, uh, and brought up Net Balance, uh, the Net Balance Foundation. The school was launched in March 2015, uh, and I'm um, I continued to be hosted by EY, so I'm based uh, there at Circular Key, and there's a great relationship there. We've, we've passed 820 members already, uh, so we're well on our way to 1,000, hopefully by this March, which is my deadline. Um, and these are people creating profiles, using the school for free, uh, so far spread across over 525 unique organizations. Some of those large, of course, Lendlease, Langer Rock, uh, Mervac. Some of those in one-man band, some of those in the sole traders. Um, and I'm delighted that if I look through uh, the list of members, these are not all the same faces. These are not all the people that I would associate automatically with sustainability. These are a lot of small, medium-sized businesses who are looking at how to create a sustainable business model. And that's really refreshing. We are funded by industry leaders like Lang O'Rourke to provide free sustainability knowledge. That is the core of what we do. And that's the other reason why providing events, uh, putting on events like today and making sure those can be seen by the maximum number of people online is, is fitting in with that, providing that sustainability knowledge uh, through uh, to companies throughout their supply chains. And none of this would be possible without our, our partners, the school's partners, uh, the Green Building Council of Australia and the Infrastructure Sustainability Council uh, from the not-for-profit sector, New South Wales Government, the Office of Environment and Heritage, uh, who of course are, are sponsoring today, Sustainability Victoria and Construction Skills Queensland. Uh, we have leaders like Cundall, uh, of course, uh, people like Dulux, Lang O'Rourke, um, uh, John Holland, Stockland, Mervac, Downer, all of these people have helped get us where we are today. And the knowledge held uh, within those 275 learning resources is grouped around 10 sustainability themes. These are perhaps the, the traditional ones you would associate with sustainability around energy and materials, water and waste. But then we start to look at more financial sustainability issues. We look at more social and community. So issues like community and economy or biodiversity or, or procurement start to change that definition. And that's something we'll be hearing about from all of our speakers. As I said, over 275 free learning resources on the website from documents you can download, videos you can watch, uh, a whole range of templates that you can look at, uh, and case studies. I still find that these are what people are clicking through to most. They want to see what other businesses are doing. How are they saving whilst being more productive? And the questions that we're asking that I would ask you today, uh, but I, I know we'll get that range of answers. The questions that we're asking businesses, what percentage of your company expenditure goes through to your supply chains? Now, in the case of many construction infrastructure firms, that's around 80%, 70 to 80%. And yet a lot of people have no idea how or where that dollar is allocated. How many companies are there in your supply chains? I know if you look at a, a project the size of the, the Northwest Rapid Transit, the Northwest Rail Link, there are thousands and thousands of companies. Stockland has 3,500 uh, companies of different sizes reporting through their supply chains. 
Can you tell me, these are basic questions, can you tell me which countries your supply chains touch? Yes or no? And as soon as we start going, well, we're a little unsure about some of these areas, this is where we need to start asking more questions, not less. And we'll be hearing from, from Zoe Leffler, uh, from EY, from uh, Jonas Bengston, from, from Edge Environment a bit later about some of these issues. What environmental targets do you have for either for management or for projects? With more Green Star and IS uh, certifications being sought, we need to be able to measure and manage these much more carefully. And so looking at what environmental impacts you're already measuring and you may be required to measure in five years' time, these are important questions. We'll be hearing from, from Molly, from Chris, about where this is going, where procurement and supply chains are going to be looking in the future. So the process should be simple. We're looking for people to register online, provide their basic details, and they create an account. This is my account, as you can see. Once they've got that, they have full access to those 275 learning resources. And you can do a self-assessment, which is really going through and gauging your levels of knowledge around those 10 issues and on particular topics. It'll then produce, based on who you are, your type of business, your size of company, who you supply to, the type of work you do, it'll give you an action plan which provides the 10 most relevant resources for you and your level of knowledge. And you can work your way through that in your own time, clicking through when you've done each one. Some of those will be e-learning modules that you can sit and do in a desktop basis. Some of those will be simple videos you can watch on your phone. Some of those will be templates that you can download, you can print uh, and fill in. Some of those are videos like uh, you know, the event that we're running today so that you can catch up with what's going on in different, sorry Kate, I, I noticed that um, photo of you. Um, some of those are, are videos you can watch to see what's going on around the state. And you can check in your account to see how your learning is progressing. You can see that uh, your last average was 2.41 last time you did the self-assessment. And in that time since you've done those, that's creeped up. So you can see how much that's increasing. More importantly, you can actually print off your action plan. You can download the PDF or you can print that off. So you can show to people you can say to projects you're working on, well, this is my action plan for this company generated on that date, and I have done these. It'll tell you when it was completed, what you've actually done, what you've viewed, what you've downloaded. And so it's a way of keeping track and demonstrating your steadily increasing levels of knowledge. You can also dob your colleagues in, or add a colleague, uh, as we like to say there. So if you think it might be relevant for finance or procurement or uh, HR teams to see particular resources, you can actually add them as well. So we're there to, to complement what already exists, to complement sustainability advantage, to complement the Responsible Construction Leadership Group, to com complement Neighbours and Green Star and IS and all of these people, and provide more of that bottom-up education for the small and medium-sized businesses. Provide that on a free, not a paid basis, and where possible to speak in plain English, to make this as easy to understand and pass on that knowledge as possible. So we're there, if you will, to provide that, those basic building blocks of sustainability on which people can build. They've done the energy, they've done water, they've done the materials modules. They can go and build that to do more advanced courses, Green Star, infrastructure sustainability, and, and more and more. And so, of course, we're working closely uh, with the Infrastructure Sustainability Council, with the Green Building Council, about how contractor education is recognized within their tools. How do you measure that? How do you uh, assess that? How do you document that in a really robust way? And what we're going to be seeing over the 2017 is, of course, uh, the first international standard for sustainable procurement, ISO 2400, which will be coming out over the next couple of months. We're going to see a focus on uh, what is called, uh, in school terms, fairness, inclusion, and respect, which is about creating a workplace that people want to work. It's about workplace relationships, work, work, uh, workplace dynamics, and diversity. We're going to see a focus on modern slavery uh, and human rights, and, and more on that later this afternoon. Uh, the Modern Slavery Act came in uh, nearly two years ago in the UK, and I think uh, that discussion, that conversation is growing uh, in volume here. And the value proposition, certainly to, to bigger, to larger organizations, is multiple economic, social, environmental, ethical, and, and risk management factors. All of those together. It's not just about that pure energy and water metric. It is much broader. And so from a risk management perspective alone, some of the issues that boards are dealing with at every meeting need to be broader. 
And from a small business perspective, it does come down to, will my business still exist in five years' time? It really is that simple. It is about creating a sustainable business model. And in turn, all of these people who are supplying two major projects, infrastructure and building projects around Australia, uh, this is what they need to be guaranteeing. So we can measure, if we look in the back end, if, if Lang O'Rourke or John Holland or Dulux look in the back end, they can measure a, a company, not an individual's, but they can look at uh, the increase in learning. They can look at how much people are learning over time. But more importantly, we can track, sorry if that's hard to read at the back, but we can track by uh, sector, by profession, where the levels of knowledge are. We can see that people in, for example, tunneling tend to have lower levels of knowledge about some of these topics. That may be because they have a very focused task at hand. That may be for other reasons. But this helps us to target particular professions. And we can look by size of business from the zero to five on the left to 500 plus people. And again, we can start to target different sizes of organizations. And lastly, we can look by topic, those 10 sustainability themes that I mentioned. We can start to look by topic and see where levels of knowledge are strong. And we can see where there are gaps. And so whilst that information isn't uh, honed down to one particular small business, we can start to see where there are strengths, where there are weaknesses, and deal with those up front. So over the next five years, as I said, risk management, changing regulations, that focus on modern slavery, uh, the ISO 2400 sustainable procurement standard, um, new technologies and materials coming online uh, the whole time, becoming available. And that's why you know, we're trying to work more closely with people like Dulux about what is available now, filling those knowledge gaps and encouraging collaboration. That's the website. Uh, that's also quite enough from me now. What we're going to move into uh, is some of those project-based and actually hearing about on the ground what's happening uh, presentations. The first of which is Chris Balzinius. Uh, he's the head of supply chain uh, here in uh, Langer Rock, Australia. Chris?